writer said, it's all about Him. Not about us. It's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope you'll turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. I was really kind of worried there a little bit when Rodney started out. But I'm afraid he's fixing to tell us they've done put him on the parallel bars. <laughs> and I don't for the life of me know how he would have got down. <laughs> Revelation chapter 11, the time of the Gentile. Let's stand out respecting God's word as we read these two verses together. The Bible says that there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. For the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Father, thank you for your word. Open our hearts to receive this divine truth and help us to know that we look at this passage of Scripture, what you have to say to us as individuals here today. In Jesus' precious name we ask it. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. When you come to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, you come to what is called an intermission in the book of Revelation. It is a time in which there is a pause. There is a moment to reflect. You go back down to planet earth and there is the temple in the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And God begins to show us some things about that temple that will be built. You see this suddenly just appears out of nowhere. You've been going along and all of a sudden here is, is a passage of scripture that seems totally out of joint, unrelated except for what God is going to say going to happen in the future. You know how suddenly things can happen. How quickly things can change. We go along in life and everything seems to be going along pretty good and suddenly things change rapidly and they take a different direction. We're going in one direction and we suddenly have to turn around because something unexpected, something unsure, something unsettled. Isn't that true? In all of our lives it happens. It may be like one couple I heard that they were hard and fast asleep in their bed at home. And there was a tornado that came roaring through that part of the country. It demolished their house and it picked up their bed with them in it. And carried it several miles and set it back down. And they didn't even have a scratch on it. And a man heard his wife and she was just crying and crying and crying and crying. And he said, honey... It's all right. Look, we're not hurt in any way. We're okay. Everything's all right. She said, that's not what I'm crying about. This is the first time in 14 years we've been out together anywhere. <laughs> so things can happen and they can happen in a hurry. And here is what takes place in Revelation chapter 11. It happens in a hurry. And God begins to show us what we have titled the time of the Gentile. And we have to understand there is a Gentile period in which we live now. There will also be a Gentile period after the Lord comes himself. I want to familiarize ourselves and synchronize what the scripture is talking about. To understand the time of the Gentiles, I need you to go back to Romans chapter 11. Just turn back there for just a moment because there is a time when the last Gentile will be saved. The last Gentile will be saved. Now, when the last Gentile is saved, things are going to change very rapidly, very quickly. The last Gentile could be saved in this service today. The last Gentile could be saved somewhere in the world today. I don't know. But when that happens, immediately is going to come the rapture of the church and the saved shall be taken out of this world. But there is a time coming when the last Gentile is going to be saved. I don't know who that is. I don't know where it is. I don't know how it's going to be. But I know that the Bible says it is. Now let's look at Romans chapter 11. I hope you're over there because I want you to look down at verse 25. The Apostle Paul writes and he said, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. That word mystery we'll talk about a little more later on. But that word in the Greek language is musterion. It means a secret hidden 
in the heart of God. A secret hidden in the heart of God. He said, I do not want you to be concerned this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. You see, there were many at Rome, as there are today, who said, well, the Jews have been totally rejected because they turned against Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verse 11 says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. So the Jews are out of the picture. They're off the, they're off the, uh, the screen. They are no more. But Paul said, I will remind you that God has prepared for them because they are His chosen people. And notice the words very carefully that he says here in this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 11 and go down again to verse 25. He said, I don't want you to think in your own conceit, well, the Jews will never be saved, they'll never accept Christ, they'll never come to Messiah. I want you to know that blindness in part has happened to to Israel. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. They have rejected Jesus Christ. They have rejected the Messiah. They have turned away from God. They are walking and mostly, if you go to Israel today, you'll find that most people there are atheists. They don't even believe in God. You'll find that all of them are agnostic. You'll find that there are Christians there. There are Jews there and Judaizers there who believe in, in the biblical principle of God, but for the most part, it is an unbelieving people in the nation of Israel. And yet the Bible says that here they are, lost and undone and separated from God. And then I want you to look at the last part of verse 25. Blindness has happened in part with Israel until, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now what does that mean? That means until the last Gentile is saved. Until the last Gentile comes to know Jesus Christ. Now when that happens, we know immediately the rapture is going to occur. And then what's going to take place? Look at the next verse, verse 26. Until the last Gentile is saved, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. In other words, what you're going to have after the last Gentile is saved and we're raptured to be with the Lord and translated in the presence of the Lord, all of Israel is going to turn toward the Lord Jesus Christ. All of them are going to turn toward Him. You can read that in Zechariah chapter 11, 12, 13. You can read about the great revival that's going to come in Israel and you can read about all the tremendous power of God that's going to be poured out there. Why is this going to happen? Look carefully. And as it's written in verse 26, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Why? Is God going to give them a second chance? Well, didn't He give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance? Right on. Amen. God is a God of second chances, the third, fourth, and fifth, and hundred chances. As far as that goes, He's a God who never failed. And I want you to know this morning, if you're in this place and you've rejected Jesus and turned from Him time after time after time after time, God has not forsaken you. He's calling you to come to Him this very day. And He's calling you to come and receive Him that you may be saved before it's everlastingly too late. But why is God doing this? Well, look at the next verse. The Bible says, For this is my covenant unto them. When I shall take away their sin. What did God say? He said, I made a covenant with them. And I'm going to keep that covenant. And I'm going to see that they return unto me. Now what is going to be the, the, the stigma of events? The Bible says, that first of all, the last Gentile is going to be saved. The time of the Gentiles, as far as the church is concerned, will be over with. It'll be over with. There won't be any more calling of the Holy Spirit for people to be saved. And, and if you've heard the gospel and you're left behind, you'll never be saved because you refuse the only begotten Son of God that you might be saved by the grace of God. And 2 Thessalonians tells us that He'll send you a strong delusion so that you'll believe a lie because you receive not pleasure in the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And because you did that, you'll be damned with everyone else because you sinned away your day of grace. That's exactly what happened. But here the Bible says, after the last Gentile is saved, the church is going to be raptured, going to be taken out, going to be translated into heaven. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians, just turn to the right to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Very familiar passage, you've heard it read hundreds of times, funerals and gravesides and everywhere else. But it is not a passage for the dead, it is a passage for the living. 
Because in that passage, he says to us again, now notice how Paul writes back over there in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 11, he said, Brethren, I don't want you to walk in ignorance. I don't want you to be ignorant because the Jews have been blinded in part that there's come a day when the last Gentile be saved when they do. All this little shall be saved. Now he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, But brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. He said, I don't want you to be unlearned. I don't want you to walk in, in mindless thought about this. I want you to understand that uh, concerning those which have died as Christians, which are asleep, that's what he said, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. And then he tells us exactly what's going to happen, that if we believe that Jesus died and rose again from the dead, even so then also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So that's the answer to many people's question. When you die, what happens? The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with who? With the Lord. So immediately you go be warned. There's no such thing as soul sleep. There's no such thing as a spirit floating around here. There's no such thing as somebody being called up out of some uh, wood tree to come and speak to a family or come to a wall. No. If you're a saved individual, when you leave this world, your spirit immediately goes to be with the Lord. Because the Bible says that when that time comes, He's going to bring them with Him. Now, how many of you are smart enough to know that you can't come back from where you ain't been? And that's exactly what you see right here. They come back from where they have been. All those Christians who have died are in the presence of the Lord, and they come back with them. The Bible says, verse 14, 1 Thessalonians 4, them also that sleep in Christ and died as Christians will God bring with them. For this we say, brethren, that we which are alive remain shall not prevent them. We're not going to keep them from being with the Lord. But look at verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God shall sound. Those who have died as Christians, the dead in Christ, will rise first. That means their bodies. There's going to be a bodily resurrection. In fact, the Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal put on immortality. This corrupt will put on incorruption. All that will happen just that fast, faster than you can blink your eye. And we're going to have a glorified body. We're going to have a resurrected body. We're going to have a body that has been suited to be like Jesus because 1 John chapter 3 says, It does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. You see, being like Jesus is more than just a character uh, development. It is more than just a spiritual development. It is being like Him after He was resurrected from the dead. That's a promise. There's a bodily resurrection. I've said it and i say it again. Satan, uh, God will never leave one bone in the realm of death for Satan to gloat over. He will raise up that body and make it incorruptible through the power of the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we'll be like Him. So when the last Gentile is saved, those who have died as Christians are going to go up and then we who are alive and remain, we're going to go up. And then the world is going to be plunged into the worship and the battle of the Antichrist who's going to take over. Now that brings us back to Revelation chapter 11 because you're in the middle of that spiritual warfare taking place on planet Earth. Now I want you to notice it very carefully because pertaining to the book of Revelation in chapter 11, you must also see Luke 21. Because in Luke 21, Jesus, as He prophesied, He said that there's coming a time when the Gentiles will tread down the holy city. And that's what you see here being fulfilled in the book of Revelation. Now these Gentiles aren't Gentiles like you and me. They're lost Gentiles. They're people who never accepted Christ. They're people who have refused the only begotten Son of God and now they're in the tribulation and they have become like hideous monsters upon the face of this earth. They have no conscience. They have no desire to do anything right. In fact, the Bible says, we've already read in chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Revelation, that they would not even repent of their sin, and they just, they made fun of the God who sits in heaven, even in their condition. When the world is dark, and a third of the men have been killed, when the moon becomes like sackcloth and ashes, when, when the moon becomes like blood, the sun becomes like sackcloth and ashes, when all these things happen, Yet men will not turn to God. So, man, I can't believe that. Well, I can believe it.
Because I've seen it and you have too. Year after year after year after year in churches, there are people who are saved and come to know the Lord. And there are other people who sit there year after year, they get up and they walk out and they have no time with Christ. Have no relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. They have a saved wife, but they're lost. They have a saved husband, but they're lost. They have a saved boy or girl, but they're lost. They have saved parents, but they're lost. Why do they refuse the truth of the only begotten Son of God? Well, he said that is the picture that you're going to have when the Gentiles begin to tread down the holy city over here in the book of Revelation. Let's look at it carefully because the first time you hear the mention of the temple, and it presupposes several things that are going to happen. Number one, when you see this mention of the temple, we must know that the Jews will have accepted fully the beast, the Antichrist. By the time this happens, they will have accepted everything that the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet want to do. They will have accepted that. In fact, they will have made a pact with the, with the Antichrist and probably will have defeated the Arabs. And the temple that you see on the screen there, the Mosque of Omar, will lie in rubble. It will have been done away with. By the way, when you look at that Mosque of Omar, some of you probably been to the Holy Land, and you stood there and you looked at it, you've seen pictures of it, I'm sure, many times on television. That gold dome was furnished with your taxpayer dollars by the United States as a gift to King Hussein of Jordan. And it was given there, and we paid for it. And it's there atop what is really the, the Temple Mount right now. And so everybody laughs at the prophets and they say, how are the Jews going to build a temple? Look there, the mosque of Omar is there. And it stands there. And it is a symbol of Islam and the Muslim apartheid. And it's going to be there. Well, I'll tell you, by the time you get to the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation, it's going to lie in rubble. And the Jews will have built or have finished the, the new temple on top of the Temple Mount. And so God says to John, I want you to measure that temple. I want you to look at it very carefully. First of all, when you look at the condition of the situation, these Jews have been deceived by the beast and by the Antichrist. They've been deceived by the power of wickedness and they're following the things of the world. You say, well, I don't see how the earth that to be after all that they've been through. Well, I tell you how it is because the world is being deceived by the spirit of Antichrist today. And it's happening all around us. The world, the spirit of the world and the spirit of the church is such that the spirit of the church has become so much like the spirit of the world that you can hardly tell the difference between the two. We brought the things of the world into the church, and we have believed that the way that the church gets better is to ensure that we've got more of the world. Well, I want you to understand the way for the church to get worse and to wither is to bring the world into the church. We hear people today look at the next statement because what has happened is that these Jews have made lies their refuge and they have accepted the Antichrist as the Messiah. They made lies their refuge. We have that going on today. People made lies their refuge. In other words, the lies of the world says you have got to do certain things in order to make sure that you build a church or initiate growth within the church. And if you do these things and act like the world, look like the world, be like the world, you'll get the world. You will never reach the world by being like the world. The world is looking for somebody that is different and somebody who will stand and somebody who will be a holy blaze for God without repentance and without apology to say this is the way. There is no compromise of the truths of God within your heart and within your life. You see, that's our problem today. Is it... We don't have many Christians and many people who are really sold out entirely for God. We've got our own agenda. We've got our own system. We've got our own plans. We've got our own directions, but they don't include God. Where is the person who is willing to be a livid flame for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ? Who will go without counting the cost and, and be able to stand without apology for the things of God? Where are they today? Where are the 
of soul winners today that burn with an overwhelming desire to see somebody come to know Jesus. Oh, we're great. And then, you know, we, we have a lot of things that, that come into church. In fact, there's an author by the name of, Brad, uh, of <coughs> Man, uh, Brennan Manning. And Brennan, uh, if you read his books, you will want to make sure that, uh, that you do not take all of it literally. You just uh, eat the meat and spit out the bone. That's what you have to do a lot of it. But in one of his books, he describes what he calls Western theology. Western theology. He said for most theological circles and churches today, maybe the old west as he sets the scene, he said, we're the courthouse crowd. We're the courthouse crowd. We like to meet and hear from the judge. We like to feel good about his verdict. And then we like to go to our ante rooms and sit around and lick on our ice cream cones, have our socials and our cake cuttings and our pie eatings, and just rear back and have a good time in fellowship with one another and enjoy some fun. He said that's one part of the theological circle of the churches in the year 2018. <coughs> but he said there's another part of the theological circle. He wasn't talking about denominations. He was just talking about the way Christians are. He said in this Western theology, he said there's a group I call the pioneer group. The pioneer group is always on the move. They have a leader, a wagon master, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is guiding them along the trail as they move along. They aren't worried about, about permanent uh, stability. They're just worried about following him who's at the head. <coughs> But they have a scout. He's called the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always scouting out there, always trying to find new things to present the gospel of, of the wagon master, and always sharing the truth of God. And then he gives us a little funny scenario. He said there are times when the scout, the Holy Spirit, he will ride back to the courthouse where everybody's sitting in comfort, licking their ice cream and having their fellowship. And all of a sudden, he'll take his big old buffalo gun and boom! And it will scare the living daylights out of all those sitting around having their little fellowship. And the men will cry and the women will scream and they'll wonder what in the world has happened. Who is this that has alarmed us so very much? content and happy right where we are. <coughs> he said that is modern theology. And you know for the most part that's exactly true. That's exactly true. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to cause waves. We don't want to change. We don't want to be different. We're content to have our little ante rooms with our little socials and be happy in the things that we do. Well, when he begins to measure the temple, I want you to notice the three things that he says to him to measure. Notice them very carefully. Number one, he said, I want you to measure the temple itself. I want you to see at large what's going on in that temple. Secondly, I want you to measure the altar. I want you to see what's going on at the altar. What is happening at the altar? Is it a place of sacrifice? Is it a place of obedience? Is it a place of prayer? Is it a place of power? Because we're measured by our use of the altar of God. Thirdly, he said, I want you to measure those who worship them. I want you to look at them and, and see where they are and how they are and who they are. And I want you to, to draw in close to their ability as individuals. You see, the blasphemies and the persecutions of the beast will continue for 42 months. And he said the only thing that's going to make a difference is the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. Well, let me tell you something, folks. The only thing that's going to make a difference in the United States of America and the world itself are the houses of God, the altars of God, and the people of God that worship there. That's the only thing that's going to make a difference today. That's the only thing that's going to change our communities and our states and our nation and our world. And we who live and move and have our being within the constructs of the temple. It's not going to change 
by the flesh and the pans and the fantasies of this world. It's going to change by those who are sold out before God. As we said, like people who are willing to take on hell this work, God. They don't care. They're just willing to live it out for Jesus and to talk it up for Christ every day. He said all this is going to happen in the holy city. Used in the Bible like no other place. The only exception is in Revelation 21 where it said there's going to be a new Jerusalem coming down out of God which is the holy city. You see, Jerusalem is so important to the world. When you look at the city of Jerusalem, everyone that lives to the east of there, everyone that lives to the east of there reads from right to left. Everybody that lives to the west of there reads from left to right. Everything is divided at the point of the holy city, depending on Calvary itself. When Jesus was to be born, it was B.C., before Christ. After his death, it was A.D. that we live in now. Everything is divided by the timeline of the holy city. Not only is it divided by the timeline of the holy city, it is a reminder that God has one special place. You read in Psalm 24, it is the nation of Israel. He has one special city. It is the holy city of Jerusalem. He has one special mountain. It is Mount Calvary, where His only begotten Son died, that we may be free from our sin. Hallelujah. What a say. It is the center of nations of the world, and we need to keep our eyes upon Jerusalem to know what and how this happened. Well, Let's look finally at the last thing, which is the measuring of the devil. The Bible says here that we're standing on Jewish ground. All the Gentiles now are warring against God. And they really believe that one day they'll be able to overthrow God. And it is only the Jews who are going to come in this intermission of the day of grace. You and I live in the intermission. The Old Testament prophets never saw the church. They never knew anything about the church. Never understood anything about the church. But God gave the church so that you and I could be saved. I tell folks, all these guys, and I don't know a lot about railroading, and I'm sure a lot of you here do because I'm working at the railroad. But what happened was that the Jew was on the main line. And he came to a juncture where he rejected Jesus Christ. And the Lord moved him over on the side track. He moved him over on the, on the side track. And then he put the church on the main line. And the church has been on the main line ever since. But one day the last Gentile is going to be saved. And the church will be off the track. And the Jew will come back on the main line again. And that's exactly what's happening here. As he says, I want you to measure this temple. I want you to measure its altar. I want you to measure its people. Because it is a mystery hidden in the heart of God. Gentiles in the church age are opposite to the Gentiles in Revelation. Gentiles today can be saved. Gentiles today are saved. But when you get to here in the book of Revelation, these Gentiles are forever lost. By hope and undone. Separated from God forever. Because of the power of sin itself. So they are measured. The Gentiles are measured. Notice one particular word back there in verse 1. And there was given unto me a reed like a rod. A rod. Now a rod speaks of the judgment of God. When you look at very carefully, the Bible reminds us that there's going to be a measure of judgment. Now watch this carefully. You've read this before, but we read it and don't even think about it. You know in Psalm 23, where it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy what? Rod. And thy staff. Now we like to think about the staff. But we don't like to think about the rock. What David was saying was I can come in total comfort and total release and total confidence to the point of death because I have been corrected by his rod. I have been led by his staff. The rod is for correction. The staff is for direction. And he said, I have been corrected. I have been directed. I can faithfully and truthfully touch him and know that even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. 
Because your rod has corrected me, your staff has led me. And I don't have to worry about those things anymore. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. So he says here in the absolute truth, I want you to take the rod which is going to ensure that they will be measured for judgment and correction. Judgment and correction. You see, judgment will surely come. Amen? Judgment comes against all of us. Somebody said that the, that the wheels of justice grind slow. They grind exceedingly sure. You can mark it out. You can mark it out. That's why it behooves us to repent of our sin and believe on the Lord. How men do things foolishly and think that they'll never have to pay the penalty. I read this week in a, in a criminal law book of a, of a trial setting in the state of North Carolina in Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a very prominent lawyer there. He was a cigar smoker. So he decided that he would buy him some very expensive cigars. In fact, he paid about $10,000 for 24 cigars. Two dozen cigars. $10,000. Well, he went to the insurance company and he insured those cigars. He insured them against water damage and against the theft and against fire and against the erosion and all that. So he insured it. He was happy in what he did. Well, as time passed, he decided he'd smoke those cigars. And he'd smoke him one a day. For 24 days, he'd smoke that cigar. Well, amazing thing. When he got through smoking the cigar and they're all gone, he filed a claim with his insurance company. And he said to the insurance company that those cigars had burned in a fire. And he wanted payment of $15,000 for those cigars. Well, of course, they said that's frivolous, that's stupid. You smoked those cigars. He said, I did, but they burned in a fire. And so they took him to court. And as the, as the trial went on, finally they came to the point of a conclusion. And the judge said, as an insurance company, you made a claim that you would pay if these burned up. You did not specify the type of fire, nor how it might occur, or what it would be. Therefore, the insurance company owes him $15,000. <coughs> you say, well, he came out ahead on that deal, didn't he? You won't ever come out ahead with an insurance company. <laughs> when he cashed his check for $15,000, the insurance company took out warrants against him, a criminal prosecution, because he had maliciously caused arson and had destroyed property that he had insured. <laughs> they took him back to court. Ended up that he was fined $24,000 and sentenced to spend 24 months in the state penitentiary. Judgment is sure to come. Comes for you, comes for me. We may think that we are going to slip by without it happening, but I'm telling you, the Bible says the soul that sinned shall surely die. There's a measure of judgment which is the rod. Measure because of unbelief and unconcern. Now God said for the next 36 months, for the next 42 months, for the next 40 months, for every day in those months, 42 months, I'm going to judge Israel. And the Gentiles are going to trod down their most precious possession, the Holy City. Now, friends, I just want to ask you this morning. If this is true with the Jews who have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, how much more so is it with we, Gentiles, who have an opportunity to receive Him? I pray today that you would refuse Him no longer. But you'd come and accept Him as your Lord and your Savior. I pray today that if you need to join this church, that you will not wait. The doors are open to receive you and welcome you. I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit today, God would speak to you. You'd say, Lord, I want to take a hard look at my life, at the altar, in the temple, in my worship. Lord, I want to see if it's just a party thing with me. If it's just a pleasure-seeking thing with me, oh, it's part of that more. But there's nothing that matches 
the world of commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we're sold out to Him. Soft and tender that Jesus is called. Will you come to Him this morning? Will you accept Him today? Will you believe on Him today? Will you say, Lord, search me. Measure me in my life. And see what I really am before God. Let's pray. Father, I ask you in this moment, in this time, as we come before you, and the salt and tender call of Christ goes out, that we would not put it off, we would not delay, we would not hesitate, but we would come quickly in the name of Jesus, giving our heart and our life before you. Lord, in all things, we can leave here and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, touch our hearts. Help us to know it is the last days, and we don't have much longer to keep waiting and waiting and waiting because there will come a day when the last one will be saved and it will have ended for all who have refused you. I pray today in this moment and this time that someone will step out and receive you as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all